Well, uh, I've been 10 years in Imperial College London, Center for Psychedelic Research, doing research into neuroscience, psychedelic therapy, uh, communal elements of psychedelic work. And uh, many, maybe six years ago, I started to do some transition. And some of the transition relates to ceremonies that I've done. All right. So I'll mention that six years ago, I've, uh, there was a group of uh, people from Devon. I did every year with them ceremony. Me and my partner went to ceremony with these beautiful Devon people uh, from London to the countryside next to Dartmoor. And we, we had a kind of a regular process once a year. And six years ago, my partner was pregnant with our first son. We were about to become parents. So it was a very meaningful moment for us uh, in time, almost a historical moment of becoming father, becoming a mother. So it was a very meaningful moment for becoming a father, becoming a mother. And uh, at that, these ceremonies and with that group, there was a lot of exchange of values, of teaching, of pedagogical exchange, of poetry, of prophecies, of uh, speeches. So there's also a political exchange of values in, the, in these ceremonies. And with that group, uh, just before the ceremony, I was standing outside next to the fire with Jeannie, and Jeannie offered her the ashes of her father to the fire, uh, who just passed away before. And it was in for our son, for the future of our son, for his health, for his uh, prosperity, for the future generation. In the ceremony, I had a strong vision of a book that I was reading at the, at the time. The book was uh, Globalization of Addiction. It's a book written by a psychiatrist, and actually a strong argument about how many of addiction problems in our society are actually sociopolitical. They related to societies that disintegrate, disconnection, alienation, and how these conditions, societal conditions, lead to addiction. And I was very much convinced from the book at that time. I saw it in a vision. It almost had this like religious, spiritual book that I'm seeing, and it's just an academic book uh, written by a psychiatrist. And then in the ceremony, Jeannie is going uh, down to the ground, and she shouts into the ground. She shouts pain. She shouts violence. It's an intense moment, and her shouting transmits from the ground to everybody in the circle. Those who lie on the ground feel the shouting coming out from the earth, and at the moment, it feels like the earth is shouting. And it's not clear if the pain that she is expressing is the pain of women, the historical pain of women, or the historical pain of Earth, or maybe both of them, and they're related. Uh, but it felt an intense moment and a meaningful moment for me. In the morning, there was an integration circle, and I was full of uh, strength. The book was in my vision. I felt her pain. Uh, I was about to become a father, was considering the future generation. And I also had this almost need and urge to say something uh, quite political to the rest of the group, speaking about the generations of our grandparents, the generation of the parents, the, the society that we're living, and this almost prophetic urge that came out of me, and speaking for future uh, generations and for the benefits of future generations and the need to create a better reality for them. So this is the talk from now on is one of my one of the ripples from that moment. The peace building work I've been doing since then is one of the ripples from from this moment. It's dedicated for future generations, and it's also dedicated for some beautiful uh, people from Devon that I learned a lot from them. So when I uh, started doing peace building work, I started by just studying groups in Israel and Palestine, and uh, it's ethnographic work. So we were finding with my Palestinian partner, we were moving, doing a road trip in the land, in Israel and Palestine, and interviewing Israelis and Palestinians who drink ayahuasca together. And we heard beautiful stories of unity, oneness, connection, intercultural connection, openness. But what was clear to Antoine, my Palestinian partner at the time, was that there's something is missing, that while people speak about oneness, while they speak about harmony, they don't necess necessarily speak about the political injustices that's happening to Palestinians. They don't necessarily speak about oppression or, in or inequalities. They don't speak about the problems of minority. They can speak about the beauty of Muslim culture or Arab music, but not necessarily about, ab about the pain of Palestinian people. 
So we kind of realized that there's something in this conversation about harmony that at times, when it's fetishized, when it's, when it's intensified, uh, can be actually suppressing uh, voices of conflict when they actually need to emerge because voices of conflict, voices of anger sometimes are required to change societal problems. And in those uh, contexts that we study, sometimes the need for harmony and oneness was just serving a status quo of occupation and oppression, uh, oppressing, repressing the minorities from speaking their anger. So uh, we decided and we, through that road trip, that was still full of amazing stories and emotional stories, crying in almost every interview. In that road trip, I met the few people that became a team that we were working together. Uh, Sami Awad, a Palestinian peace activist for 30 years that I wish was here with me to give this talk. So we gave this talk together a few months ago. And uh, Armel Lehman, Israeli therapist, another Palestinian woman who I cannot uh, name, she prefers not to be named and a Brazilian uh, facilitator called Indius Brazil. And we were working at a, at a team with few others and slowly kind of contemplating what we want to create. We want to create a practice, a psychedelic practice, an ayahuasca practice that is directed towards peace building, that has its, its at its heart a collective intention, how we move beyond personal therapy, beyond personal healing, into a practice that is also addressing societal issues. So we journeyed ourselves, of course, as a small group in order to learn from the medicine. And we journeyed ourselves, we integrated ourselves, and slowly, slowly we created a political practice. And in this practice, there was an intention of coming as a collective together, exploring identities, exploring collective traumas, uh, connecting as a community, but always with the intention of also how to bring visions of new action into the future in the land. So we created a retreat, uh, a retreat program, and we had three different re retreats. And the retreats were run through a charity uh, in Israel, together with Israeli-Palestinian uh, researchers, and myself as a researcher for, from Imperial College London, uh, kind of collaborating together to create this retreat. They were facilitating, I, I was doing research, but it was very much combined. Three groups were flying into Spain with this intention, uh, for an eight days long program. But before the program, there was preparation. They were traveling to the West Bank. They were uh, going to the separation wall. They did tours in refugee ca camps in the West Bank. So especially for Israelis, this was a meaningful moment of being exposed with their bodies to political reality and the uh, politi political atrocities that happen that sometimes they block themselves. Especially many of the medicine people, the spiritual people in the land seem to, to, to bypass. In order to be in a well-being and mental health, sometimes it's easier to ignore the harshness uh, of reality and the moral uh, responsibility on reality for, for Israelis. So some of the Israelis who joined who were willing to also to be open and to listen already started a transformation when they moved uh, just by exposing themselves to the separation wall, just by being in refugee camps, start, something started to move in them. So just before uh, going into Spain, there was already tensions. It was uh, a year ago in the spring 2022, and uh, it was the end of uh, kind of COVID. It was the last month, I think, that we needed permissions in order to fly to other countries. And uh, the war in uh, Russia, Ukraine began, and there was political turmoil and tension. Uh, just before flying to Spain, Brazi Indius, the Brazilian facilitator, flew to the Ashaninka tribe in, uh, in the Amazon, and he learned from them new songs. He helped Benki, one of their spiritual leaders, who was also a political and environmental activist. He helped them build uh, his new place over there. And at the same time, for two months, he learned uh, new songs. And the songs of the Ashaninka, their songs, uh, they're quite strong. It's a tribe that's known for its resistance to uh, different occupying or oppressing forces since the time of the Inca, which was also an oppressive empire to some of the indigenous people. And, uh, and the, the, tr the music that Indios brought already carries a certain strength in the ceremonies that were there in Spain. 
So we arrived to Spain and we're doing a practice that bring all the identities, bring all the collective trauma. For a few days we're having conversations, very personal, uh, but through personal stories that know how to kind of go into the politics uh, and align the personal and the political, suddenly the political consciousness is weaved through the stories of different individuals in the group. By ha having few sharings together, the stories weave to each other, the traumas are weaving to each other, the Holocaust, the lineages, the Nakba, the future, the occupation, the pain, the, uh, the pain of women, all of that starts to weave to into each other to, to some political consciousness. And with that consciousness, we entered into the ayahuasca ceremonies. So we were there in this uh, faraway land in Spain, Extremadura, uh, between a Zen monastery, a uh, Sufi community, a uh, wide river, a beautiful mountain. And in the, still in that land, when people were saying the word uh, Israel, Palestine, we were speaking about home, they were saying here. By mistake, they were not saying there, they were saying here. As if surrounded by the same people with this conversation, they were still feeling as if they never left home. And the, 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 the intensity of the, of, the, of the moment was felt, but also the excitement, the hope, the pioneering, the really feeling that people are stepping into uncharted territories in psychopolitical consciousness. So when the first group entered ceremony, they entered ceremony, they arrived from Israel full of excitement, but excitement mixed with doubt. And they entered the ceremony with doubt. There were tensions. Uh, the ceremony, the first ceremony began, and it was already quite intense for people. There was a lot of collective trauma coming to visions. There was a, a Muslim person who was purging collective trauma, saying that he was uh, supported by the group. A Israeli woman who has visions of uh, Holocaust and cycle of cycles of oppression and moves into the altar in the middle and prophetically prays for the end of uh, cycles of oppression uh, for Israelis feeling the guilt of becoming from oppressed to becoming oppressors. And she expresses this in the circle a at the moment. And there is one, mo one moment in which Erez, who is uh, Israeli, he feels uncomfortable, he feels uncomfortable in his body, and he goes outside uh, from the Maloka into the forest. And he really wanted to deal with his, uh, kind of heal his pain. And in the forest, he sees a vision of his grandma. And his grandma uh, is there, but she's playing tricks on him. She's like doing like this, she's clowning, she's laughing at him, she's joking. And this is an old Jewish strategy of dealing with pain is humor. So she's kind of like really playing tricks on him. And at the moment, she te he tells her, uh, Grandma, please don't, don't do this. I came here to deal with my pain. I came here to deal with my trauma. I want to heal it. Please don't play tricks on me. Please don't do jokes. And he gets what he wants. And at the moment, she, became, she becomes a snake there in the forest. And it's all becoming very scary at the moment. And lizards and insects, they go out from the forest and his visions become very, very scary. He feels that something, there's evil, there's some ineffable evil, uh, evilness in the air and he goes and he feels he's actually in Eastern Europe in some ancient time of pogroms and he's hungry and he's starving and he's trying to survive and he's looking for food and there's snails coming out of the ground and he goes and he starts digging for food but what he sees when he's under this tree, let's say this is the tree, and he's digging next to the, the, the tree, and he finds a mass grave of his ancestors. And his ancestors are kind of looking out from the ground, and at the moment they are telling him, leave us alone, don't dig the pain of the past, we are here, we don't want, us, we don't want to deal with it, just leave us alone, we want to rest, we have never rested for a long time, and we just want to continue to rest. So he's full of that pain and respects the request and he goes back to the Maloka and he goes to other thoughts, who's going to take his kids to the nursery, uh, where, what's his grandma going to do, who's going to do the dropout of the kids and then he goes to drink another cup of the medicine 
and goes back to his seat and have another vision. In that vision, he's beaten by soldiers. It resonates with the story of Hassan, a Palestinian person who in his stories shared his trauma of being beaten by Israeli soldiers. And it was Erez look at the soldiers uh, who was beating him. It's not clear to him what he sees. He sees Israeli soldiers. He sees people from Eastern Europe. Uh, is it the programs? Is it now? But when he look in the eyes, he sees the eyes of his ancestors. And he feels the pain, he feels the despair, and it's not clear for him that anything can be done. And it's quite a depressing moment for them. And with this energy, he ends the ceremony. And the ceremony ends, and the integration, everybody share, and he shares all of this. And one of the Palestinian artists at the evening does a, a, a painting integration. Everybody paint their experiences. And Erez paints his experience, he ex paints the mass grave of his ancestor, uh, but he puts the heart uh, coming out of the ground uh, from, from the mass grave. And he kind of adds humor to this. Then he goes out to the tree at the forest, and he goes to the tree and he puts a uh, lead light beam up the tree, a spiritual light ladder of sorts for the mass grave of his ancestors. Before the second ceremony, everybody have uh, doubts again, and there are cycles of doubt, doubts and confidence. But everybody, <sighs> okay, we're going to do it again, dressed up in white, go to the shower, relax, decorate themselves, uh, coming ready and all putting the intention of this evening we're going to be together we're going to journey together if the first ceremony was a very personal experience quite chaotic everybody a bit in their their own world everybody wanted to be together in that ceremony and this is how the ceremony begins the ceremony begins with a <sighs> relaxation into togetherness there's joy everybody are sitting in the meditation chairs feeling each other eyes are open uh, enjoying the togetherness the oneness of the moment the unity and it's very relaxed the music is very enjoyable and everybody really feel held by others at the moment with that uh, energy Eris goes outside from the maloka to the night air and he sees uh, Omar, a Palestinian person who has been guiding Israelis in many transformations. And he invites Omar to the mass grave. And he goes down to the mass grave of his grandparents with, a spirit, with his ancestors with a spiritual light ladder. And he goes down and he starts seeing them coming up, kind of coming up from the mass grave into the, into the ladder. And he helps them, he supports them, he puts his hands on the ground. And Omar is standing next to him kind of protecting him and it looks like a monk from a, like a church or something like this. He nods to Erez as if he's seeing also those ancestors uh, passing by on the ladder. And he supports them, he thanks them for everything they've done. He says, you can go now, you're released. And then with his, uh, with his hands on the floor, he lifts it and what stays on the ground is this heart shape. It's the heart that he manifested in the story uh, the day before. It's a heart that somewhere in this mass grave in this Eastern Europe until today. And he, then he goes back to the Maloka. And in the Maloka, he sits again. Uh, but the tension is back. The anxieties are back. And like almost every group, there are cycles. There's an emotional synchrony of the whole group. There's a togetherness, and suddenly there are doubts. There's tensions. There's anxieties. And he returns to a moment of anxiety, but every anxiety, every tensions are uh, opportunity for breakthrough. So psychological tensions are opportunity for catharsis, for emotional breakthroughs. Cognitive tensions are opportunity for insight to penetrate them. And collective tensions are opportunities for celebration. And a celebration is invited to the space. Indius, the Brazilian facilitator, takes out a guitar and he beams togetherness to everybody in the group. And he really brings uh, the spirit of joy, of alegria, uh, realizing, okay, let's bring the celebration into life. And this really <sighs> brings the energy up. S people starting lifting each other. Uh, Ella wakes up from her despair, banging on the floor, shouting, like this dancing, <laughs> shouting. Uh, one of the women, the Palestinian woman, ecstatically dances, wildly expressing all of her ghost outs, releasing all of her ghost outs. Uh, everybody are there in a very collective, ecstatic dance, uh, releasing the, the pains, releasing the trauma, being together, supporting everybody at the moment with joy. 
And the group really realizes, wow, that's the moment. And they relax, they sit, we continue to sing more songs, it's beautiful. And then there's one moment again, going deep. And in that moment, uh, Hassan, Hassan from the stories of the trauma being beaten by Israelis, uh, Hassan from that story suddenly bursts with anger and shouts. And in that bursting of anger, he shouts, Halas, release me, Halas, release me. And it's triggering, and it's, and it's everybody feel the trauma, the, the trauma, not the traumas of the past of the ancestors, but the day-to-day -day trauma of Palestinians, the soldiers being beating, beating Palestinians, the day-to-day -day violence, the current violence, the continuous violence, and they're afraid. And it's, the Israelis are afraid at that moment, because in a way, Israelis are always afraid that once the Palestinian unconsciousness is liberated, then the Palestinian would seek revenge, right? So it's a like, very prim, primordial fear of Israelis that once Palestinians are liberated, they would treat Israelis violently on all this history, past history of violence. So the Israelis are afraid of the moment. They're looking for support of each other, but the process stays in the group doesn't go outside, stays in a group for around 20 minutes, and it's a there's anger, and slowly, slowly, everybody hold that process together, sing songs to Hassan, beating the drum patiently, holding the process together until it kind of relaxes. It's still going on a bit, uh, but the rest, the whole of the group goes outside to the fire, the ceremony is about to end, sitting around the fire with music, relaxing, while uh, Sami and Omar and Erez are just holding the space for Hassan. I go to check how's it going for them, uh, if everything is okay, and I see them next to Hassan. They're eating an imaginary pizza, smoking an imaginary joint, uh, and they, they order the pizza uh, on their imaginary phone. They give me a slice, and uh, that's how the evening ends. In the morning after, a uh, sense of kinship, of family, is uh, strong in the group. They've been through a strong process together. There's something new that has emerged in them. There's a certain responsibility, a certain sharing that they've been. There was a celebration, but there was also going and diving deep into the pain, diving deep into the anger. Uh, and what is shared at that moment is in the integration circle, the integration is theatrical. So People can share their uh, experience, not just in words, but they can also reenact some of their experiences. So uh, they can also use other participants to reenact. You can ask other people, sit next to me like you did in the ceremony, sing that song for me like you did in the ceremony, and to kind of have the experience coming into life again. And they're reenacting some of the experiences. But what is happening also that they speak with quite confidence and vigor and strength and speaking about the importance of anger in the expression, realizing how anger is also, uh, one of the women says, how anger is uh, uh, energy to work with, how fire also purify energy of change. A uh, Israeli person, a very kind of medicine, relatively new agey, very amazing uh, facilitator, peace and love, uh, who was kind of apolitical and politically disengaged, suddenly realized the, the, the pain of Palestinian people, and he says, from that moment, I will carry this message on to wherever I go, to wherever I work, I will carry this message on. And this is an intention for action for him. He's intending to change his behavior. He putting, he's putting there this in front of the rest of the group for his accountability. He says, I'm committing to change my own actions. I'm committing to also bring the, the political pain of our reality to wherever I go, even if it's in medicine circles. So the, the process of the first group ends, and uh, everybody are hugging. We're kind of don't want the facilitators don't want them to leave. There's a new sense of uh, family, and uh, we hug them. Uh, they go back in a bus. The facilitators go to the river, integrate, speak a lot about what happened, and get ready for the new group to arrive. And the second group to arrives. Again, they're excited, uh, but they're a different group. They're kind of a group of rebels, you can think. They're more teenagery, they're more activists, there's more fire in their spirit, uh, they're quite wild, 
And uh, this group didn't have much process about collective trauma, but their political pains were this more uh, wider pains in our societies, uh, pains of dislocation, of confused identities, who I, where do I belong to, what is my home, uh, who are my people, uh, a kind of like a confused identity coming, uh, looking for a new sense of belonging in, in the space. And uh, I, what I'll share soon is music from that, uh, from, from one of the ceremonies that was edited. Uh, we we're going to do it soon. Uh, music from one of the ceremonies that was edited. And what you can hear here is how Hebrew and Arabic are uh, interweaving into each other. I want to say that the importance of music in like really opening people or triggering people uh, is quite uh, important. It brings also the fears and the angers, but it also opens. And in that sensitive state, it brings a lot. Uh, and what you will hear also in this is the diversity and why, why you listen to it is that you can hear the diversity of the processes. So things can start quite chaotic, quite tense, and then they build up. And when the building up happens, there's usually pockets of care created in the group. Uh, the practice that we, we did was very participatory. So it wasn't a facilitator that could uh, facilitate the whole evening. It was uh, a, fac a facilitator really encouraging the, the group to bring themselves. At times, this can be chaotic because the group doesn't know how to do it. And uh, they learn slowly, slowly. And uh, in the chaos in the beginning, there's a lot of intense processes. Then pockets of care are emerging. And then maybe suddenly a sense of togetherness that is, that is created by the group kind of uh, left with uh, just uh, celebration and joy. So you hear the diversity of the processes. You, see, you hear the Arabic and Hebrew uh, intertwined. And feel free to close your eyes, feel free to uh, lie down if you want, it will be five minutes, and then we come back.
Yeah, so that's uh, just a taster. I saved you from a lot of the purging and the intense processes. Uh, and it's a taster for just to, to experience that the medicine and, and psychedelics or ayahuasca has also, it's very relevant also what is the culture, what is the music in which it occurs. Here, this is, these are musicians that were participants and ex ex expressed themselves through this. And they're actually uh, the Israeli and Palestinian that met in those ceremonies and they're still collaborating. So more than a year ago, and they're now working on projects together after meeting in those ceremonies. So uh, the second group ends its process. Again, strong sense of kinship, of care, like really, really, really strong care between uh, people, like a family. But like a family, it's important to, to mention that families are not always extremely harmonious. Uh, actually, families can be full of conflict, right? So it's not necessarily a harmonious field. Uh, but it's a field of a lot of care and a strong connection uh, between people. Uh, and it's really fe people start feeling like there's a new family that's emerging. And with that, uh, we hug, we, we, we say goodbye to, 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 this new to the second group. Uh, we go integrate by the river, the facilitators, and a third group arrives. And the third group, uh, just quickly, um, again, processes of collective trauma, but also this group has the majority of Palestinians in it. And the interesting part of this group was that there were, for the Israelis, it suddenly was hard to be a minority in the situation. There was almost a process of power inversion uh, that the Israelis experienced. I also experienced that. Uh, so it was a bit hard for the Israelis suddenly to feel a minority. There's maybe even a larger threat in society for Israelis, the idea that one day they would be a minority in the land, and that played a part there. And also for the Palestinians, how to accommodate Israelis in their fear and accept them in their fears and help them to be included in that space. And again, the third group uh, ends with a lot of uh, kinship, with a lot of family ties, uh, strong bonding, uh, and uh, commitments, the day of commitments for the three group, the last day, it's a day of commitments, and all three groups commit to continue working together. There's a strength at the moment. There is really hope. There is a feeling of uh, identity fusion of a family that's coming together. There's a lot of intentions for actions. So a lot of people commit to themselves. They want to be in service for others. They want to take continue to take caring of others. They want to continue to to do actions to try to change reality around them and to collaborate as a community together. And with that excitement and energy, everybody returned to the land. Uh, there's few integration gatherings, also bringing the three groups together. But the return to the land and bringing all this hope back to the land is not an uh, easy process. And for many people, more than a year ago, they're still integrating. So that uh, intense connection that happened in the program, but then returning to a land uh, that the architecture of separation just continues to separate people is a hard process for some. So for some, uh, the, there's a lack of uh, space. There's no physical space in which they can continue to meet. Uh, the Palestinian uh, and Israeli musicians who weren't want to work together feel pressure. Uh, for example, the Palestinian from his record company, uh, he wanted to sign a contract with a record company. They told him, you cannot sign a contract if you are collaborating with Israelis. Uh, and he decided not to sign with them in the end. But he had to face these tensions from within his community that also separate him from Israelis, even if the, the, the attempt is to uh, have a political message together. But through what they're doing in the integration, there's a lot of creation. There's a festival they create together. There's an Israeli-Palestinian uh, couple that moved to live together. They met in the retreat. They moved to live together. Uh, there are uh, art artistic expressions. There are ecological, uh, environmental activities. There are ceremonies that are done in the cave in the desert. And these are all organized by participants from these groups. So they really try to move some of this energy into reality around them. For others who don't manage to move this energy into action, they might come into challenges. Or for those who suddenly return to uh, alienating reality, uh, they might come into challenges. So you can imagine that there's a paradox of connection. If you feel an intense connection in the moment, but then a Palestinian returns to Ramallah and doesn't have a spiritual community around him to speak his language, it's harder for him to, to meet also the ones he was journeying with. He might suddenly feel uh, uh, even more strong sense of alienation. 
alienation. There might be also a paradox of liberation. You feel suddenly free, uh, completely free at the moment, but then you return to an oppressive reality, and that moment of freedom just reminds you even more how oppressive and challenging is the reality around you. So these are challenges that are in many psychedelic experiences, but here they even there have been even more strong for, for some of the people. Uh, but with this ecology of care, with this community around, people try to take care of each other, try to help each other, and they started to support each other's processes on the long term. So a whole year after, even those who had challenges, most of those even who had challenges, after a year said those challenges were an important part of their uh, change. So any change would come for a challenge. A Palestinian woman who left the West Bank and now moved uh, illegally to, to Israel, uh, comes with, it comes with challenges. She left uh, the, the home of her family, she moved to another job in Israel, and there are challenges, people took care of her, there was a moment of anger, there was a moment of despair, but a year after she's out of it and she feels much more free and liberated. And for many people that moment of transition from getting uh, away from their own identity, from uh, their own group of belonging into something new uh, was a transition moment that was hard and required uh, support from each other. So it wasn't just like a quick fix like this. There was actually required some uh, change uh, and some challenges on the way. So what I uh, want to conclude with is a, a thought uh, that a healthy integration, we know that like after psychedelics there's a need for a process of integration, and uh, healthy integration requires psychological supports, requires people to speak with, requires a community to be around, requires maybe some mindful practices like uh, like being in nature, like doing meditation. Uh, but I would like to put also the, the need for action uh, that's coming in the integration. So a lot of insights, a lot of moment, uh, breakthroughs, revelations, they're also a call for action in some moment. So you can imagine like a, a ripple, right? So there's something that wants to ripple out. Uh, like in many events in our life, like a scientific insight that ripples into, uh, into a theory, like a falling in love moment that then ripples into creating uh, slowly, slowly a relationship of trust and care, like a revolutionary moment of people spontaneously in the streets that then needs to ripple into a political force, a political power uh, that has also uh, 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 effect on reality. But if that doesn't ripple, if uh, people are uh, completely excited and hopeful in the streets, and then it's hijacked by another, you know, the old story of how our revolutions are hijacked by other forces, uh, that can bring even more despair in the moment. So what is important to, to, to understand in this integration and ho is how to support ripple, how to create a movement that comes out of psychedelic insights from psychedelic breakthroughs and how they can ripple out into society. And this can be healthy, not just for society, but for the individual itself in gaining agency and purpose and understanding they can also have some power to change. Thank you. Beautiful. I just wanted to say what a true blessing your work is. And my question is this. So much of sacred plant medicine work is focused individually on the interior journey. Yet, what makes your work is remarkable is that you brought a focus on the outward difference our lives can make bringing positive change into the world. What specific practices during the time of the ceremony and after were most useful for bringing, for helping people translate vision into action? So I'll mention, uh, two th so the, the question was what were the uh, practices, the meaningful practices that helped to create a practice as collective and to transfer vision into action. Uh, so I'll first start with the practice that we did in the beginning of each retreat because that was almost the bedrock of the whole program and what allowed to align uh, uh, personal and political. 
and what to actually reveal that the personal and the political, and with that we'd, we entered. So in that practice, uh, it was a few days, and each person was, uh, it's called a spiritual questionnaire. It's a practice that my Palestinian partner has uh, been using for many years. And uh, the questions each person is answering in front of the group is, uh, the first question is, why are you anxious about the conflict personally? Then the rest of the questions, they're personal questions, they're not about political, but they slowly reveal political. So the questions are, uh, what's your name and who gave it to you and what's the meaning for you? What brings you hope in life? Who are your angels? What are your demons? What, where your ancestors come from? And influential text uh, in your life, an influential figure, and transformative moment. Uh, when are you passive? And these questions, they seem quite like uh, cute, I think, but they slowly, slowly reveal something in the person. Uh, what is your relationship to death? And they reveal something in the person. And for the, the practice is more than one hour, it's a one, and one and a half hour for each person. And after the person is sharing that, the whole group reflects for them back uh, what they hear uh, without interpretation. Uh, and that allowed for the person to really click things between his political, between the first question and his own identity, his own personality. And when the whole group does that, the stories weave to each other. As I said, the stories are weaving to each other. Uh, I can share this questionnaire. It's like the, the questions that are really, really digging into this personal political. And I think that was the, the bedrock of the things. And I think from that moment, when the, the practice and the experiences, they are political, they're personal, then the, the, what happens after the ceremonies also becomes that. So you're not really just doing things for a amorphic, uh, abstract political cause. It seems very personal from, from that moment. And uh, the later on, you know, the, the process of how integrating into a community from vision into action is something that is actually we're, we're still learning. So uh, it's not something that was easy, and for some times it, it wasn't necessarily easy. We tried to create really a process in which the, the participants are helping each other. We were b very much believing in emergence. Uh, so how to empower participants to whatever actions they want to initiate, to be with them in the moment, and to, to help them create that action. So not necessarily the facilitators are creating actions, but it's the participants creating actions and inviting others. And we as facilitators, we joined them, which was kind of a helpful for a momentum to, to take place. Uh, some other things that were happening is to create a, a network or like an ecosystem of potential actions. So a lot of times people came with a lot of excitement but they didn't really know how to like discharge this excitement in reality. So they just need the opportunities. So creating like the, a person you can go to and he can tell you, oh, you, this was your process. Maybe you should find, go to these group of people and join them and start to work on that, you know, that cause. Maybe work with this group of people. So to create like a, a, a network of potential activist options but for many people they didn't want the regular activism they seek new th new things and that's when they created that themselves uh, but that's a, a hard process and I think in future uh, groups would put much 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 more attention on actually integration it's obviously like a cliche it's everything in integration uh, but we didn't really know how to to prepare ourselves for a thing like a collective integration. We really knew what we're gonna do in the program, but we didn't have a good plan on the integration, and we're open to any new ideas of how to do this. Yeah. Leo, you're amazing. Um, really quick one. Um, are there any other sources of global conflict that you think that this would be particularly amenable to? I didn't need to make you come all the way over. No, that's good. So other sources of conflict, you know, I think it, uh, a lot of uh, Americans have approached me to do like Democrats, Republicans uh, conflict. Uh, I think it can be uh, applicable to different situations, always with a sensitivity for the l complexity of the local uh, conflict. There's always differences. Some conflicts are more symmetrical, some are less symmetrical. So the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a very asymmetrical conflict. Some are more symmetrical, and there's always need the sensitivity for the si for the context for the situation. 
but hopefully we're right now we're like uh, I'm opening a foundation, a charity in the UK to continue to do psychedelic peace building. And the idea would be to do a few years more of Israeli-Palestinian, but if we feel like we have something that is ready, so to teach other or, or, or uh, work with other groups of facilitators in other situations that uh, how to do it in other, other situations. There's a person who contacted me who wants to do uh, for uh, legal disputes, right? So for uh, divorcees who just like don't agree on the on the final stuff or uh, work disputes or family uh, inheritance, right? So many families break up in that moment. Uh, so I think even in that sense, you know, it can be on the very local family disputes can also be something that can work. What's that? Preventative ones, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, first of all, also, uh, thank you for this work and for the publications. I had read your article about the processes, and that's wonderful. Uh, and what that called to mind for me, those collective processes, that, that brought to mind the Eleusinian mysteries, where the psychedelics were used not for healing, but now to instill a common... or cultural values and, and deeply ingrained. And you see the potential for that, and, and therefore for that kind of mechanism to scale. I kind of think that this is how they're used also now, medicine festival, this is not just uh, uh, a personal healing, right? There's a cultural event with music. I think a lot of times, even ceremonies or festivals, they might speak the language of like inner healing, but in reality, it's a cultural practice. And it speaks the language maybe of like Western society or the need for personal healing and therapy. But actually what is created is a culture, a community. Uh, and I think that, uh, even if it speaks a different language, a lot of the ayahuasca practices right now in neo-shamanic Western practices are actually collective communal practices uh, de facto. Like this is what they do. And this is why people actually join them because that gives meaning to be in a community. Thank you, Leo. Like every question, I very much admire your work. I was interested in uh, the extent to which, say, comparing this to something like what Bill Richards is doing with religious leaders, um, what kind of interfaith potential does this have when we're talking about experiences which are often couched in spiritual and theological language and they're understood by individuals in those terms um yeah was was the um what kind of interfaith dialogue was brought up as uh, and um and on that vein yeah do you think it could be helpful say in the in the uh, um traumas to do with ireland and northern ireland and those troubles which are also both tribal and religious to some extent. Thank you. Yeah, so interfaith. So when I did the ethnographic work in Israel-Palestine, there was a lot of interfaith exchange in the rituals that I study. So this was not rituals that uh, I uh, helped organizing, uh, but there were groups of Jewish and Muslim in there uh, in the ceremonies, like reading from Kabbalah, reading from the Quran, and actually doing like this kind of back-to-back -back, uh, stuff, uh, but also really uh, taking it outside the ceremony and continuing like creating dialogue through this mutual experience. So definitely there is that, and I see that also in the ceremonies we did uh, in Spain. But there was a bit of a l the the religious context was a bit like the Jewish or the Muslim context were not as strong. Uh, but actually in the land, what's happening in the land in Israel and Palestine has more of that. So there's a lot of uh, Jewish ayahuasca practices. There are uh, Orthodox rabbis who lead ceremonies now in Israel. Uh, there's quite a lot of like religious language. And again, with interfaith exchanges, it's, it's good, but it's always to be good to be sensitive who is the dominant faith in the exchange, right? Uh, like, like with a religious study of Bill Richards, it seems that they invite like a lot of people. Uh, they're like diverse, but maybe their practice is already Christian 
it is already Christian because it's it's created by Christians and they might invite imams and rabbis into their, their study but there's always a question whether it m succeeds accommodating uh, other other faiths uh, in their own uh, ontologies and their own ideas and their own culture uh, so it's always good to be sensitive sometimes the dominant faith or the dominant culture is blind to its own uh, you know status quo and the whole state of things uh, regarding Ireland, uh, I think so. I don't know really. I'm not. I don't know too much details, but I think it can be helpful there. Again, there were people who approached me uh, in the past. The, the situation there is uh, more of maybe uh, restorative, right? So there is like uh, it's a uh, pain that people are trying to get out of, and I think that's an even easier situation than the Israeli pa Palestine, which is a a living conflict, right? So I think there's opportunity there for, for healing through dialogue, uh, through meeting and really bringing the past, but also with the hope of just like uh, letting it go and creating a better future. I think so. I, I, Jesus Christ. You keep missing. Um, I'm curious about if you've thought of or if any of your colleagues are working with the diaspora on both sides, both like Jewish, Palestinian, Israeli, and a kind of growing xenophobia, both for Arab, Muslims, anti-Semitism. Yeah. So there was one Palestinian uh, diaspora in one of the groups, uh, but we had a rule of no diaspora. Uh, but now we're open to that. We see that they're also a big part of the, the conversation. They have very much influence, even sometimes stronger influence than the, the, the local, local people. They have a strong influence on what's happening in the land, the Jewish diaspora and the Palestinian diaspora. So we would like to work with this. I am working with other people. So this project is also embedded in like a larger culture that's emerging. It's kind of the, the project also uh, ignited others to think similar ways, and I was also connected to other who had same thoughts. Uh, other projects uh, of working with, uh, let's say, Middle East uh, regional more uh, identities. So there's a jam. Uh, it's happening in Sinai. So Rawan is a friend, and she she's one of you know Rawan, Rawan and Liel. What's that? Oh right, right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, and also there's uh, there was recently the in Burning Man they have a, a camp Cosmic Camels and it also has a lot of diaspora a lot of Palestinian diaspora was this year in Cosmic Camels it's also a Middle Eastern camp very political very psychedelic but very political uh, also good friends are part part of this so I know projects that are addressing this and I think they see like a larger Middle Eastern vision in their in their mind right. Uh, and I think it's good to, we were, plan we were planning to continue to work with this. Yes, and the pain of diaspora, what it means to be diaspora, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely, diaspora has their own challenges, they bring their own uh, voice uh, into it, and they, they they're, they're uh, you know, the Palestinian diaspora is a big question because they're not allowed to return to the land. The Jewish diaspora can return, they can return to the land if they want. Uh, but the Palestinian diaspora really feel that they're still part of a process because they've been kicked out at 48, they cannot return to the land, uh, and they're still influencing a lot of the Palestinian voices because of that. So the right of return is a big question for Palestinian, and they're still victims of the situation. Uh, yes. I hope it answers, but we would, there's, a, there's indeed a lot of ex to explore there in the way of like how we conceive things as relational, right? So as also the, it was important for us to bring from the Palestinian side, Palestinians who live in Israel and Palestinians who live in the West Bank, because they have a bit of a different voice and different challenges. So also to bring Jewish and Palestinians that live outside of the land is bringing a, a more complete picture to the situation. Last question, okay, yes. Hi, sorry, um, it's a very, very simple question. Why Aya? Uh, first of all, my own experiences. Okay. 
then because I think it's the most I was not just interesting in the substance but the ritual and I think in Western society we from all the substances we learned and acquired from different people with this one we really learned also to work uh, in the context of a ritual right so there's no there's no culture of rituals around uh, mushrooms there's no music yeah. that's made for mushrooms so much yeah. and there is music and there's culture uh, West even Western or adapted and kind of changed that is part of our culture so I wanted to not just work with a substance I'm actually working with culture in the same time and that's the the main reason and it's also stronger <laughs> so, so are you very are you very comfortable with the appropriation of it then uh, I'm not very comfortable of the, with the appropriation. I think it can be uh, done in different ways, but I also don't see everything as uh, I see. I can see things as more dialogical, right? So there is an exchange of culture sometimes. Sometimes it's completely brutal appropriation, but sometimes there's uh, there's dialogue, and even in the indigenous people, for many of them, ayahuasca is something that's relatively new. Uh, it has been moved in the Amazon relatively new. It's constantly in the move. It sends like many technologies uh, and many ideas and thoughts. It's moving. And sometimes it's really extracted, you know, and the extraction might be a problem if we use resources of indigenous people. But if you, for many indigenous people, it's a way to create dialogue. It's a way for them to work also, bring Western people to their own reality. Uh, they, they create connections with activists. So I think I'm not completely uh, okay with appropriation, but I also see that there's a, a, it is a dialogical exchange. So it depends when and how. Uh, we were working with uh, Brazilian facilitators who works also with a lot of indigenous communities, and I felt comfortable that what we bring is in relation to that. I think that was the last question, sorry. One more, okay. Do you want to decide? I don't want to decide. Okay. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Um, what do the majority of Israelis want? Do they want to continue with this oppression or do they want to find a solution? Uh, the majority of Israelis probably want to continue, I think. Uh, Israel is not a, a healthy place politically and there's also a lot of internal turmoil. Uh, what I was even addressing in the population we were addressing in the project are those who want to make it better but maybe fell in despair, don't know how to do it, have certain ideas about uh, maybe separation, two-state solution, which it becomes impossible slowly, slowly. And there is, I think for there are many Israelis who want to heal the situation, but don't know anymore how to do it. And they're a bit uh, stuck in the past in some ways, in their ideas of solutions, that they don't even imagine the possibility of, let's say, having a democratic one state across the whole land, right? Uh, they, don't, they cannot imagine that. It would be giving up ideas like Zionism, you know, which are strong for Israelis, or the idea of a Jewish state, which is strong for Israelis. So I think the, the situation, uh, regardless of the majority and or what's the majority wants, is like how to create a new vision that would be appealing to, to people, that would also be, has its own charisma and its own uh, attraction uh, for a better future in the land, I think. But right now, the majority of Israeli, like the, the, the situation is quite despairing, right? Also for the peace camp or the liberal people in Israel, uh, there's probably lo of loss of power, uh, strong loss of power, with the fear of becoming a dictatorship soon. Thank you so much, Leo, and thank you so much, everybody.